Hey everyone, so uh, in this section we're going to talk about error and error analysis. Um, because of a lot of the stuff in uh, AP Physics 1 dealing with having you design an experiment and focusing on conceptual aspects of physics, uh, one of the things that they want you to do is understand the concept of error when it comes to collecting data, finding out and knowing how we can uh, deal with error, get rid of error, you know, things like that. Uh, so First, I just want to ask this quick question. So pause the video working itself and we'll go over a second. All right, so the question is, what is the length of the pencil? Now, if we look here, the pencil at the very tip, this uh, eraser part, uh, is somewhere between 25.5 and 26 centimeters. So we have to estimate somewhere around that uh, middle number. So you can get any number that's probably around 25.6 to 25.8. Now that range is uh, fairly wide. So one of the things that we want to do is find a way to, when we give our number, to represent and uh, show people how accurate that measurement is. For example, if we had a measurement that, uh, well, I'll get to that in a second. Um, so what we end up doing is we uh, have to add in our error to our measurement in order to actually show people that whether or not our numbers can or can't be trusted what we'll do is when we make a measurement using some item we'll give a number and then we're gonna add on the the range of error that's uh, allotted to it the bigger that error number the more um, I guess you could say inconsistent or unreliable our measurements are. So for example here because of the I said before that it was some range between 25.6 uh, and 25.8 you could say 25.7 you could say 25.75 uh, it's about the same um, and because we don't know if this is exactly the number like it could could have been actually 25.7 you know, we're eyeballing it for a bit. What we would say is that it's 25.75 uh, plus or minus 0.1. So it's basically saying that it could be anywhere within that range. Um, now, where does this number come from? A lot of this stuff uh, comes from the, uh, there's a way to actually do measurement like this. It, it's actually based off of the smallest division possible on these, uh, our measuring devices essentially. Now if we were to graph data, so every time we make a measurement in a lab, um, all our measurements carry uh, error. Sometimes the error could be bigger or smaller depending on the scenarios. Uh, if you were to graph it, you would end up uh, with a graph that looks something like this. So here what we put is that those ranges, these are called error bars, uh, in order to represent the range of the numbers. So again, uh, this point right here has very large error bars showing that it's a um, it, it's a measurement that has a very large amount of error but uh, this middle point and this uh, point over here their error bars are really small so they're fairly accurate um, for the most part I don't really expect you to have to do error bars on labs but this is something that if you uh, continue on in physics and you have to take it in college, you'll definitely have to do this uh, on labs. All right, now there's a bunch of different types of error uh, and you have to understand all of them and you have to know, you know what causes them and what, how to limit them. So uh, the first type of error that we want to talk about is systematic error. Uh, systematic error comes from uh, the precision of our tools uh, and basically the only real way that we can limit this is uh, using more precise tools. Uh, there's no real way to get rid of systematic error. All it does is uh, transfer the error to some other place. Like for example, uh, going back to that ruler, instead of having a ruler that had the smallest division or having a, a mark every 0.5 of a centimeter, maybe we could use a tool that has a mark every 0.1 of a centimeter. Uh, or maybe we could use a micrometer or we could even use a laser to type uh, kind of measure the size but regardless of the method there's still going to be some error because the 
item will never really land exactly on a line. Uh, now, usually what we say with these uh, tools when we use them is that it's going to be half of the smallest division. So um, if the smallest division on the ruler is one millimeter, then we would say that the error is plus or minus 0.5 millimeters. So that's kind of where that 0.1 came from. Uh, realistically, I guess I probably uh, could have written it as 0.25, but uh, same thing. Um, for something like that, you wouldn't normally see a ruler that has divisions of 0.5. Uh, but as long as you kind of give it an idea of how accurate that number is, that's kind of the main idea. Um, now, a second type that's going to be super common is human error. So, because most of the labs that we're going to do, especially uh, run with humans, um, there's always problems that we do. There's a ton of mistakes that we make during the labs, and uh, this also includes into uh, the measurements. So, for example, there could be human error in, in measuring the tool. So, again, this almost goes back to the systematic error, but a lot of times you can look at uh, the ruler and depending on where you're looking or how, it could also move uh, where the tip of that ruler, uh, tip of the object is relative to the ruler. Um, and then also miscalculating data or misrecording data. There's really no way to um, represent this in your data, uh, but reaction time is another one. Uh, a lot of times you're gonna be measuring time of, of uh, movements and things so your reaction time will affect the measurements um, yeah so kind of going with the whole uh, reaction time uh, a very common example of how we can incorporate that into our measurements uh, is if you had a scenario where you're recording the time it took for a person to run between two points and you're using the stopwatch um, your reaction time is going to be about 300 milliseconds. Um, so the that because that's typical reaction time. So what you would do is I don't know if I have the number here. Um, all right, I, I didn't write it here, but normally what you would do is if you measured the time uh, that the person ran to be let's say 10 seconds. Where's there is this? 10 seconds to represent that we were using uh, a human to measure this time, we would give the error, I don't know, there it is, plus or minus 0.3 seconds. So this is how we'd represent uh, a measurement done by a human. We would give the time that we found and we would write in um, the reaction time of that human, which like I said, is gonna be about 0.3 seconds. Um, there are ways to actually limit this, uh, and you'll see one of the ways later, and I'm going to explain it when we talk about, you know, doing labs, uh, though I'll say right now, it has something to do with doing multiple trials. Uh, typically the only real way that you can eliminate human error, um, is to just kind of replace a human with a computer. Uh, so that's something a little bit different from systematic error. With systematic error, there's really nothing you can do. All you can do is just make it smaller. But with a human, you can completely get rid of them. The problem is, is that once we replace the human with a computer or a robot, we're going to add in additional systematic error. Um, you know, delay times between the measurement of a device and the recording of the device, you know, things like that. Um, and this, while at times this could increase the accuracy, it could also end up decreasing it. So a lot of times, the less complicated an experiment, the more accurate it is. Uh, keep that in mind when you're designing experiments. Uh, like I said, sometimes you'll be designing theoretical experiments, experiments that you're not actually going to be doing. Uh, but the way it's going to be tested or graded is... I'm going to be thinking about how accurate of a lab is this. So if you're coming up with a, this crazy experiment that could go wrong, you know, a hundred different ways, you're going to end up losing points compared to the person who does a lab that's just drop a ball and measure the time type of thing. All right. So the third type of error is statistical error. Now, uh, this is actually one of the main ways that we can actually 
minimize human error without actually adding in uh, any sort of additional um, systematic error. Uh, this is actually what happens when we do multiple trials. Um, this this helps to limit uh, limit human error in the sense of the fact that if you're timing someone, even though uh, the delay time for humans tends to be about like like I said 300 milliseconds or 0.3 seconds, uh, a lot of times humans will tend to um, either jump the gun and press timers too early or they'll be too late. So uh, what you can do is when you do these multiple trials, some some of those measurements will actually be early measurements, some of them will be later, and by taking an average of them, it'll kind of get rid of all that human error that was in there. Um, multiple trials is actually one of the ways that we're going to be uh, making sure that we can kind of limit our errors as much as possible. When you go to design experiments, uh, you're going to have to make sure that you include multiple trials for this exact reason. Um, so yeah, it gives us a much more precise measurement. Actually, another uh, really good example of where statistical error helps to bring down the overall error, uh, especially with human error, I had mentioned before that um, if you measure the time that it took for something to move from one point to another, uh, let's say you measured it to be five seconds plus or minus, uh, well actually let's say it was a really quick time and we ended up this scenario where we had the measurement to be 0.5 seconds, but because of our reaction time, that's 0.3. That's a huge error uh, relative to the length of that time. If we, instead of measuring the time it took for it to complete that movement one time, uh, if we let it go multiple times for a little bit longer, maybe we increase the distance about five times longer, uh, then this error stays the same, but now the length has uh, the length of time has actually increased. Uh, but most of our measurements would want that original uh, measurement, so we can actually take both numbers and divide it by five to get a much more precise measurement that we would want. Point zero six. So this is a, a nice way of taking um, a measurement that has a uh, human error that could be significant error and finding a way to kind of bring that error down so that uh, it's a much more precise measurement. Uh, again, I'll, I'll mention this stuff as we get closer and start doing more laps. Um, so as, I, as we are kind of mentioning, with, especially with the systematic error, uh, when we do multiple trials, we're going to end up having to take average values. And also, we might end up having to do what's called an average deviation. So uh, we all know what an average is. You know, you have measurements that vary uh, from all, all over the place. An average kind of gives you um, a rough idea of what the numbers are pretty much going around. Um, an average deviation, on the other hand, uh, is a way of kind of showing how spread out those numbers are. You know, uh, numbers such as, I'm going to try to make up numbers off the top of my head, 2, 5, and actually, yeah, we'll say 8, end up having an average number of about, uh, I believe it should be, um, yeah, this would have an average of 5. On the other hand, if we had the numbers 4, 5, and 6, this also has an average of 5. So we can mention, uh, we have a way of showing that this type of measurement is much more spread out and I guess you could say almost uh, less accurate than this measurement, where all the numbers are pretty close together. And that's the average deviation. Uh, the way we're going to find the average deviation is by taking each of the numbers that we got and finding the difference between the uh, average and the deviation. Note this is a, a absolute value difference. So 2 minus 5, we're going to say is 3. That's a deviation of 3. Uh, and 8 minus 5 is a deviation of 3. So we could do this, find the deviation for all these numbers, um, 5 to 5. 5 is 0, so 3 plus 0 plus 3 will get us 6 
divided by 3. So this has a deviation, an average deviation of 2, while this one would have an average deviation of 2 thirds. So again, this is how we would show that this set of data was much better and more accurate than this set of data. All right, so here's the next question. Pause the video where itself, and we'll go over in a second. All right, so to find the average time, what we're going to do is take all the numbers, add them up, and divide by 3. That's just your typical average. So you should end up getting 10.2. Uh, one thing you should notice is that if you did do the average, it's actually closer to like 10.2333 repeating. Uh, but one thing that you want to try to keep in mind is that whatever the number of digits uh, the measurements are giving you, that's kind of what you want to carry on here. So the fact that the smallest division is to the tenths place, we want to mimic that here. Uh, for part B, finding the average deviation. So uh, again, we take uh, our original measurements, subtract them from the average. So this becomes 0, this becomes 0.2, and this is going to be 0.1. Again, remember, we're doing uh, absolute value. So we're not actually caring which one's in front because all these numbers should be positive numbers. So if we add all this up, divide it by 3, we end up getting 0.1. So our average time is about 10.2 with an average deviation of 0.1 telling us that the numbers that make up this average are very, very close to the average. Right. So uh, this is what we could say. And again, uh, the average deviation, that's a good way. That's what we would add to this um, error. So this is our uh, statistical error. And by doing this, this is a lot better than if we only did the measurement once and had uh, the human error involved with 0.3 seconds. So again, th this is an example of how using the statistical error limits the human error. All right. um, now, one thing that you'll see, you'll see one question on the AP like this, but what would happen if you actually were to do math with one of these measurements that have error? Now, the good thing is that you shouldn't be seeing any uh, scenarios where there's two measurements with error because that requires a much more involved um, calculation. But if it's a if you're doing a measured error, uh, uh, measured number with error into an equation that doesn't have any sort of, um, you know, all the numbers are non error based and non measured, then you just plug it in, do the math normally. Um, so, for example, if you had uh, the diameter of a circle to be 5.4 uh, plus or minus 0.2 centimeters, and you want to find the, uh, the radius, as we know, diameter is, uh, whoop, sorry, diameter half is the radius. Uh, so, what we would do is take this number divided by 2, that would get us our radius. So, we just do that. We divide this number by 2, we divide this number by 2 and we get that the radius is 2.7 plus or minus 0.1. Okay. So that's pretty much all you have to worry about. Uh, I don't think you'll see any other uh, more complex scenarios because there, there are ones where if you had to square a number that had error, again, that requires a little bit more involved uh, calculation. Probably won't see it. Uh, like I said, it's going to be strictly uh, adding numbers, dividing numbers, subtracting numbers, all that stuff, um, that's what you're going to end up uh, doing this with. So you'll see a few examples, but it doesn't pop up that much. So just try to keep your an eye out for it. And like I said, uh, I really only expect about one question on the AP to include this. Uh, there's one last thing that we want to mention about error, and that's how we can use error to figure out if our measurements are good. So um, one way is using the error range that we have and seeing if our if the actual number falls within that range. So if we had a scenario where we measured a 10 meter object and we measured to be 9.1 with a uh, an error range of one, which is you know not really that good because that's a fairly large error, um, we would see that 10 does fall within that that average. So you know because that number includes anything between 
uh, 10.1 and 8.1. So 10 meters does fall within this range. So that tells us that our measurements were good. Not super accurate, but um, good. Uh, the second thing that we could do is calculate the percent, uh, the, the percent error. So if we know what the accepted measurement is and we know what um, we could take our measured number, do a percent error. And if that percent error is less than 10, then it's good. Uh, recall that the percent error is given by this equation, an absolute value of measured minus accepted over accepted times 100. Uh, one thing to note, it doesn't matter the order of these two because it's an absolute value. Measured minus accepted and accepted minus measured are the same thing. The only thing that matters is that you divide it by the accepted. So uh, if you ask me for, you know, to remind you what the percent error equation is, you'll commonly hear me say it's the difference divided by the actual. So that's what I'm referring to. All right, so here's the next question. Pause the video work itself and we'll go over in a second. All right, so we have the actual measurement to be 10. We have the measured measurement to be uh, 9.2. So to find percent error, we subtract those two, get 0.8 divided by 10, gets us 0 0.08, and then times it by 100 to get 8%. So our, so our percent error is 8%, which as we said before, is less than 10. Therefore, this is a good measurement. All right. Uh, now, I've used the words pre uh, precise and accurate a few times. Um, they actually do have a very specific meaning. Um, accurate is referring to how close your numbers are to the, um, the intended target. So again, if uh, in the scenario before where I had, uh, what was it, the number, I think it was 9.1 plus or minus 1, uh, because the fact that the intended number 10 did fall within this range, that would be an example of being accurate, but not really precise. This number was way too big. Um, so this is a, uh, a scenario where numbers could be jumping all over the place, but at least I'm around that middle point. Uh, on the flip side, we have something like this being not accurate, but being super precise means that you're not close to that middle point, but all your numbers are uh, lumped together. And then accurate and precise means they're lumped together towards the intended target. Now there actually is a reason why they um, make this distinction. Uh, a lot of times what it can do is uh, pinpoint where your error is. So for example, in a case like this, if all your measurements are really, really close together, uh, but not that close to your intended uh, measurement, what that usually means is that you have some sort of uh, error, uh, typically systematic error, that you're not taking into account. Like maybe your ruler is actually starting at one centimeter instead of at zero, because uh, some rulers actually do that. Or actually going back to the ruler, you might have a ruler that does this, where there's a zero over here, uh, but you're using this to be zero. So. That could be another example of um, an error that would result in this. This usually refers to human error. There is something that you're doing wrong that's causing the numbers to drastically change because you're measuring numbers too early, then you're measuring too late, and then you weren't paying attention or something. So that changes where everything goes. So uh, by looking at to see whether or not your measurements were precise or accurate and what's going on, that could tell you what your error is originating from. Um, like I said, one of the main things to take away from this and the reasons why we're going through this is that you want to be able to know when you're designing labs, what, where are the errors going to come from and how can you limit it? Because that's going to be one of the things that uh, is going to dictate how many points you get on the AP. Uh, like I said, we're going to do some practice with this. So don't worry, by the time you take the AP, you'll have done, uh, I would like to say, almost 30 to 50 uh, design your own experiment type things. All right, uh, and that's pretty much it. If you have any other questions, please let me know. Otherwise, good luck, and I'll see you later.